Welcome to Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. Today we're talking about reimagining the American identity. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I believe that leadership creates strategic advantage and is a key lever for creating the world that we all want to inhabit. I'm a regular contributor to Forbes and the lead author on an award-winning book series focusing on innovating how you lead and transforming your organization. I'm also a fellow with the International Leadership Association. I am delighted to have on the show with us today Amiel Handelsman, a seasoned executive coach, and Jewel Kinch Thomas, COO and co-founder of the Jazz Leadership Project. Amiel, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Maureen, and thanks for having Jewel and me on today. So I've been in the leadership development field for 20 plus years. I actually got into it even before that uh, when I was too young to advise anyone, but it was a great apprenticeship. And uh, I work with companies and organizations ranging in size from 150 people to 100,000 people, mostly with senior executives and teams. And uh, as we'll get into, I am partnering with Jewel as well as Greg Thomas on a new program called Stepping Up. Wonderful. And you and I met each other almost 20 years ago in some of our some of my early leadership training. We met in Boulder. It was called Spirals Over Boulder. And <laughs> early for both of us, probably. I had been in the field for a while then, but it was certainly in my a nude my orientation to what we call integral. Yeah, might as well. And Jewel, uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself as well? Yes, thank you so much, Maureen. It's great to be here. Um, I am a coach, um, coach small groups and individuals, and also facilitator, as you mentioned, with the Jazz Leadership Project, which looks at leadership and team development through the principles and practices of jazz music. So uh, very much been immersed in arts and culture for the last 20 some odd years and a big proponent of the power of the arts to really help us um, formulate who we are, how we function in the world, and, and what we can look at in terms of solutions moving forward. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. I'm delighted that both of you are here and such an important topic. So we're going to talk about a couple of key questions. How would we approach America's racial reckoning if we framed it as a hero or heroine journey? And what would it mean to use this metaphor for developing leaders? So Amiel and Jewel join me today to discuss their approach to this very timely and important topic. So on that note, let's jump in. So you've chosen in your writing and the step up course that you offer to frame America's racial reckoning as a hero or heroine journey. What made you decide to do, take this approach? I'll, I'll take a first stab at answering that and Jewel will piggyback on, on top of that as, as well. So part of what's important to recognize is that human beings, leaders, all of us, we already pay attention to the world in stories. There's always a story happening. There's me, there's these other people, there's a drama unfolding. And no matter where you are in the dynamics of what we're calling America's racial reckoning, you're living in a story. Now, there are some people who are pure white supremacists who have a certain story about the world that they tell. And I'd rather not <laughs> describe it, but uh, we might get into it a little bit. Um, then there are some folks who are uh, anti-racist, who have a particular story. Uh, and then there are people who are opposing those anti-racists. It gets very complex. Everyone has a story in their mind. And what uh, Jewel and Greg Thomas and I realized was that it could be quite valuable in this very tumultuous, conflictual topic to frame it as a journey that we're all going on together. Uh, and every journey, hero or heroine's journey, has protagonists. And what's unique about how we're looking at it is we want everybody to be part of the story rather than there being people who are all good or all bad. Now, obviously, uh, white nationalists, they're not going to be the front and center hero of my story. 
but they're human beings. And uh, we have to learn to live in a society of, of respect, even for people who are don't respect us. So a large part of this is, is that, is saying, let's create a store where we can all be protagonists. And second of all, with the hero's journey, we can confuse why we are in it. Why, what, what is the call that we answer with the monsters that we're slaying along the way or the challenges that we face? And so in the stepping up course and in all the programs that we're doing, we're asking people to differentiate the conversations and thinkers and writers and people that they find frustrating from why are you in this to begin with? What is it inside your heart, inside your mind, inside your body that feels called to act now to speak up and so those are a couple of reasons we've chosen that metaphor jewel so i would add to what amiel has shared that um, those stories are based on self-awareness um, what do we what do we believe uh, what motivates us um, what are our values so as we go through this journey, we are looking for that self-awareness to expand. And as that self-awareness expands, then we can extend uh, our storytelling to others. So it is, it's a journey of growth. It's a journey of discovery. It's a journey of acknowledgement because you're acknowledging things about yourself that either you were, uh, you are very aware of or have revealed themselves, you know, through the conversation, through the communication. And so then you can decide um, what they mean, what, what the meaning is that they bring to your life and to the way that you engage and, and what your communication looks like or, or doesn't. So it is very much a journey of self-awareness to understand um, how we are responding or not to this racial reckoning and what our belief systems, how they are steering us uh, on that journey. Thank you. I love the idea that it is not just those people are bad and we need to change them, but starting with self, who am I in this community? whether it's the global community or my family or my church or my school, that as a member of that, the change really does start with me. And also, Amiel, that you said there are certainly people we fundamentally disagree with, but rather than demonizing, how do we start to build the relationships and the bridge of understanding coming again from Jules' point of a place of self-awareness rather than a place of how we often, especially as activists, come in and say, those people are doing bad stuff and we got to fix it. This sounds like a significantly different way of navigating the process. Yeah, I was going to say, I wanted just to follow on the notion of clarifying intention. Uh, before we even design the Stepping Up course, Jewel, Greg, and I reached out to friends and colleagues we knew who were interested in this to invite them to uh, interviews. And one of the main questions that we asked them in interviews is, why does this matter to you? And the reason that's an important question is that in talking about George Floyd, the police, inequality, justice, all of this, it's easy to get caught in a third person conversation where we're talking about these forces out in society. And then we get polarized and we respond and we get conflicted and we forget why we're even in the conversation to begin with. So what we found when we asked folks, what makes this important to you is that actually each person's answer was unique. And it drew upon their own life experience. I remember one person who told me that when she was, this is someone who identifies as white, when she was a little girl, she had a friend over with darker skin and her mother said, she's not allowed to play with you. Now that, that's part of her story. 
as to why. And, and I think she felt some shame about that. And she realized she was committed to approaching human beings differently than her mother had, right? Now, we also, I heard from someone else whose parents were in the civil rights movement. And he felt like he was carrying forth their legacy, that he was continuing these commitments that mattered to his mother and father. Notice what a different orientation that is. And we've heard from even from others who are a number of people actually in our uh, events that we've done who have been people identified as white who have chosen to work in largely black organizations or communities, dedicated their lives and recently, sadly, found themselves under attack for not saying or doing the right things. And this just breaks my heart. It's a different calling. And that person could probably spend a lot of their time feeling the pain of being under attack without remembering why they're in this to begin with. So that's how we come back to center. And always, as Jules said, what is your intention? It sounds like the most basic question. And yet, I think all of us here know it's a question worth asking every day. So before we step into the hero and heroine's journey, the underpinning of this seems so foundational and is different than any other program that I'm aware of. And for that, not because it's different, but it is different in a way that seems much more inclusive and um, designed to impact in a sustainable way rather than giving a set of rules. And if you follow the rules and don't say this and do that, then you're okay. And in my view, that works mostly with table manners, but not with complex and nuanced, and maybe not always with table manners, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know which fork you're supposed to use mostly. Outside. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're in a nuanced conversation, and I think of even my family members. So I have a niece who just joined the police force, um, and, and she is very committed to equality and equity. So is she painted with the evil brush because she's now part of the police? Um, and she's, she's doing the work from inside, having to navigate some of her colleagues who have less progressive views, also coming from their family histories and decades of work on the police force. This happens to be in D.C. And she joined right before January 6th. So an interesting time also in our history. And so the topic for me seems so important to bring together the precious souls who are trying to make an impact the best way they can. And pro by providing the Stepping Up course and your other writings and podcasts, creating a conversation and, and a, um, scaffolding for people to act differently seems again, just foundational. And both of you have a coaching background, so I'm curious the underpinnings. Well, Maureen, I can say that um, over the years, there have been so many instances where I have felt um, frustrated. Um, each and every time there was a, um, a, a racial incident, um, when there was something that obviously brought this, you know, smack back in our face, and and it's it's here, it's living, it's part of our everyday, um, everyday living, and there would be a law, or a, a like you said, a rule, or something created, a hate crime uh, legislation, or so, and I kept saying to myself, that's not going to do it. You don't change people's hearts. You don't change their minds. You don't change their perspective by creating a law that says you should not hate that person because their skin is that color. It just doesn't work. So the thought behind this course and and as, as that kept coming up for me and repeated over and over again, was how do you connect with people 
on an internal basis that says, I value this other person and I value them because they bring a certain connection, they collaborate, they uh, contribute, they are human. Um, and, and that's all that they need for me to be able to say, okay, I can, I can, I can speak to you, I can approach you, uh, I can you know, go through life and, and not feel as if I have to protect myself against you based on some you know, um, upbringing, based on some uh, traditional um, patterns or beliefs. Uh, so it's, it's the internal work that has to be done that is going to help make the difference in how people shift their mindset about how we live and breathe together. Um, and only when it happens internally can it then happen on an external basis. That's, that's what I think. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing more of your story as well and, and how, what brings you to this. And Amiel, how about you? Like Jewel, really like all of us, you know, one can go way back in life to look for the seeds of the, of the journey. And, um, and I've had a series of experiences throughout my life that made this um, important to me. Um, I think what I've noticed through my own work with leaders is that there is a thirst for uh, an understanding of how complex things are. And many of us in the field have been talking about this the last really handful of years, just honoring the complexity of life, honoring the complexity of organizations. And so around racial issues and racial topics, very often there's a lack of complexity. There are a series of simple stories clashing up against each other. Jewel gave a, a brilliant example that a law will eliminate crimes of hate. Now, maybe we need both. Um, and even the example of how do we, in light of police violence, which is real, what is to be done about that? I think it actually is a important opportunity to reflect on why do we have law enforcement? What's the purpose? What are the functions? How is that different from, let's say, mental health professionals? Who ought to be doing what? Saying that doesn't mean we just go and abolish or defund the police. And all you have to do is look at surveys of people living in inner cities and broken out, let's say, by uh, black Americans. There's not a lot of support for that because in spite of the violence from police, there's, we all need the protection. We have, um, we have these, these are parts of the foundations of our society and our democracy of having some form of law enforcement. And so that's just like a simple example of, uh, of how complex this is. Um, and also many of the dimensions that we talk about in terms of um, inequality, um, injustice, many of them have to do with uh, larger issues of wealth and class that go beyond the color of our skin. And in fact, if you ignore a lot of those things, you actually don't make things better and because you're ignoring some of the sources of the challenges that we have by simplifying them, by making it all a quote unquote racial, uh, racial issue. And so, you know, what we've challenged ourselves to do, Greg, Jewel, and me, and what we're inviting others who join us to do is to say, well, let's look at this from a variety of different perspectives. That doesn't mean a mushy, every perspective is equal. It means that there's, <laughs> that it's worth saying, yeah, there's really troubling things happening now, and there's a lot behind it, and there are good things happening now, and there's a lot behind it. And just having the sense of groundedness and relaxation to acknowledge that, I, I personally find it very refreshing whenever I hear it. Yeah, I do as well. And again, back to the, even people whose choices are very different than what I support, 
come to this often from, well, they always come from a life history that informed those choices. And while I may disagree with their perspective, it is their perspective and they've gained it for some reason. And calling them bad and devolving to um, us, them rhetoric isn't going to further the the behavior that we are all looking to create, I think. Even the people whose, whose choices are different than mine, I, I believe mostly want to raise their children in a safe place. They want to support their families and uh, live productive lives. This is where I feel like the heroine's journey metaphor is so valuable. I don't know if that's what you want to talk about, Jewel, but I think at some point we've got to get there. Well, yes. I mean, we, we can, I think, start just from both of those journeys, uh, the hero and the heroine, because they are both journeys of transformation. They're both journeys of growth, understanding what your growth edge might be. Um, and and how, do you, uh, how do you walk it to and through the challenges and the obstacles that are going to come up in that journey? And they're going to come up because they, they always do. And it's how we grow as individuals and as human beings. It's always about finding that space um, that, that's going to allow us to do better. Um, and the, the journeys, for the most part, um, have the, the same stages in terms of the call um, what, what, it, what is it calling you to do, to act? Um, what, what is the, the, on the horizon? What's, what's the vision? Um, and, and of course, there are a, a variety of thresholds that you have to go through, the, the ogres and the dragons that you have to slay. Um, and, and then when you bring back, for the hero's journey, when you bring back that the, what is it called? I mean, the talisman. The elixir, either way. The elixir, yes. Yes. That is going to help make the community better. Um, th those are, are very similar. Um, one thing, and I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, Maureen, tell me if I am, um, about the heroine's journey is that it is a more, shall I, let me put it this way, the, the heroine's journey is a forward-thinking journey that embraces the people around her. So it is not so much a solo journey of uh, achieving victory at some level um, or coming back with that elixir and, and, and heading out there on your own, you know, striving to, to kill the dragons. Um, it is about a journey that, that starts with compassion and, 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 and these are both energies. Let me, I have to say that this is not about male and female. This is about feminine and masculine energies of which we can embody both. So it is really about understanding what is needed in a, in a particular situation. Um, am I going to lean more into my feminine energy or into my masculine energy? Um, so I don't want to get too far ahead there, but um, the reason this this um, dastardly topic, um, and we, we think it can go through uh, a heroine and hero's journey is because on um, each step of the way, pe the people who feel that this is a calling for them, um, they are going to run up against the conflicts. They're going to run up against the, 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 the people who think that they don't know what they're talking about that, or that this is, is futile. It's been here for 400 years and, and it's, it's not going anywhere. Um, there are going to be instances where they're going to uh, question themselves and, and can they really do this? This is all part of the journey. And, and then to come out on the other side uh, with a better understanding and clarity of who you are, how you can contribute, what the difference is that you can make is, is what we, is what the six months is all about. Well, one thing to add, just one might wonder, who are these ogres and dragons? 
Because we've just said a moment ago, for those paying close attention, that we're not out to be against anyone. So the ogres and dragons can show up in a variety of ways. It can be the inner turmoils within ourselves, the inner challenges of just mastering or managing the complexity. That is, those are real challenges. There's also the environment around us that can feel polarized, tense, ungrounded, simply feeling like you're getting knocked off balance, which we heard about over and over again in our interviews of folks saying, every time I enter a conversation like this, I feel like I'm getting knocked off balance and I have a hard time finding my voice. So regaining balance and finding one's voice are the equivalent of battling the ogres, right? It's not a person that we're trying to hurt. It's an inner and outer challenge that we're all doing together. Um, and this is, I just want to emphasize the together and the feminine part, because I'll speak personally. Uh, I really, I love the, the solo hero's journey on a very visceral level. That's what I was raised from an early age, you know, the single hero. And when I was in fifth grade, it was who can make the most home runs playing kickball. That's the hero of the class, you know, and later on it had took on other dimensions, but you know, certainly as I've gotten older and gotten uh, in touch with the value of being connected with people and being together and some of the feminine energies and which we can talk about in different ways, that's been part of my growth. And that's why Jewel's point is so important. It's not about male or female, it's masculine and feminine energies. And so it really is a journey to integrate those within us. And then for some who have more feminine energies, it might be integrating the masculine energies. But whatever you're doing, we're saying, hey, this is a journey. This has some possibility and some oomph to it. And the other part about that is so many of us in this conversation get caught in resignation nothing can get better or resentment. These other people did something bad and they can never make it up to me or guilt. I've done something or my ancestors have done something and I can never make it up to you. And so when we frame it as a heroine and hero's journey, we're saying kind of like snap out of it. Let's all snap out of that mood and let's uh, begin by accepting what's true and seeing the possibility. And also one thing that Jewel so beautifully talks about is seeing the grace behind even some of the most challenging moments. Oh, this is, I'm so glad you brought that out, Amiel. This is something that gives me goosebumps every time I, I, I consider it and I think about it. And I, and I, um, I, I just wish that people would see more of this in themselves and in others. Um, this came up for me last year as I'm reading some of the news articles um, about the, the instances uh, of, of police violence and brutality that are happening. Um, and one of them was uh, Jacob Blake and uh, the young man who was shot seven times in his back um, in, um, in Kenosha, I think it's Wisconsin. And his mother, prayed with police officers in her son's hospital room. And she said uh, that the, the, the rumblings that were going on out there about, you know, uh, payback or fighting against the police and all that, she said, this is not who we are. She said, America can only be great if we behave greatly. And she said, and when she said that, you know, I thought, wow, here she is. She's standing beside her, her son's hospital bed and she can find space within herself to, to open up and, and consider other people and bring them into the experience that she is having right then, right at that point which was devastating. You know, I, I, I thought about it and I said, you know, would I 
in that instance, be able to 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 open a space of grace and think about other people. The the other instance that brought this home for me um, is uh, Christian Cooper, who was the 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 man that the African American who was in Central Park bird watching, and <clears throat> Amy Cooper, yeah. who's absolutely no relation, but a, a white woman. Um, he asked her to put her dog on a leash, which was part of the park's guidelines, and um, and she kind of lost it and decided that she was going to call 911 and say that a black man was uh, being aggressive or threatening her. And when they decided, when she lost her job and all these other things started happening to her as a result of that incident, he said publicly, um, I do not want to be a part of that. I want to err on the side of compassion. And those two incidents for me just said, my Lord, if we can find that energy of grace for ourselves and the space for others inside of us, this could be a totally different world. You know, we could respond to each other in ways that, you know, we can only just dream of in this moment. And so I think that hidden grace, as, as Amiel put it, is something that we need to, to seek. It's something we need to build. It's something that we need to, you know, continually look for. We need to seek it and we need to open it up in ourselves. And these, these words that Jules using, uh, grace, courage, compassion. What are these? These are virtues. So now we're speaking the language of virtues, which was very unpopular in the United States for a long time. And I think has come back, which many listeners may be familiar with positive psychology. It's also come back in branches of philosophy where we're now willing to see the practical benefits the transcendent and even self-interest benefits of attending to our virtues. And notice how infrequently, unless Jewel's speaking or some other folks, we hear that language in discussions of the racial reckoning. We don't hear it a lot. So we're bringing forth a part of being a human being that is so core to who we are. And interestingly enough, the language of virtues is also something that is very familiar to folks who perhaps have more traditional values and who Steve McIntosh in his book, Developmental Politics, talks about heritage values where, um, yeah, where there's a respect for tradition, the respect for virtue. So bringing this forth is really, a, it's one of the reasons why in the call, one of the calls is the call upon and answering the call for the journey. The call upon is what virtues do I feel like I'm being called upon to enact? Now for me, Amiel, one of them is courage, right? One of them is courage because I can get uh, pessimistic. I can feel down. Uh, so courage of seeing the inner resources that there's an inner support within me and around me to take action is so, so significant. And that happens when we do what Jewel just did in those examples, which is say, yes, this was enormously painful, even um, unjust. And what else is true? Now, last thing I just want to say about that is some of us listening might hear what Jewel said and say, it sounds like she's trying to negate the injustice. <laughs> so what do you say about that, Jewel? No, 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 no. The injustice is there. It needs to be acknowledged. Um, it it needs to it needs its space to breathe. We don't want to negate that. We want to expand the experience that includes more than that. And they were able to do it in that instance. It it didn't. They didn't go you know, um, off to a retreat for a month and meditated with that and then came back and decided, 
okay, I, I, I understand better now. I know that there there's a, a an opportunity here for a, a empathy and, and, and compassion and, and these things that move us in a different way to engage with people. It was right there as that horrific event was occurring for that mother and for that African-American man who could have been then accosted by police or whatever that you know, could have happened from that point. Um, but it's looking at how we, we can be so much more multidimensional than we give ourselves credit for or the power that we can find more of that in ourselves and more of that to share with people than I think we actually realize. Oh, I was going to say one of the frameworks that we've been using, Dan, I'm hearing a bad echo. Are you hearing it? Okay, it went away. Uh, one of the frameworks we use, uh, and Amiel, thank you for mentioning virtues, and we're now referencing it in all of our books, is this idea of virtuous character. And this comes from the work of Mary Croson and her co-authors that talk about um facets like courage and jewel as you talked about transcendence the um, purposeful optimism and moving above and collaboration and humanity and humility and temperance and, and justice all informed by judgment so that too much um, humility means i don't step up too much temperance means i may be more tolerant and when i though drive, combine those with drive and humanity and accountability, then what comes out in each moment is the tying this all the way back to the idea of intention. If my intention is to create a world where we all have a space, that we all are treated with dignity and respect, bringing these virtuous character elements that and we probably all have different labels for them really provides a solid framework and it sounds like that's built in so that participants can have a framework such that it is repeatable when when they're no longer in the room with the two of you because i imagine in the room with you things all seem crystal clear and then we walk out and um life is messy Absolutely. And, and, and I, one of the things that we do and will we'll do is um, have provocations, creative provocations that will um, bring um, a video or of a, of a particular instance or an, an article and, and, and allow people to sink into those instances in terms of uh, what it means, what does it look like? What feelings does it evoke? Amiel um, has a, a, a wonderful conceptual uh, framework around moods, which if we have time, perhaps he can uh, share. Uh, but the, the micro behaviors um, also that uh, people can look at in terms of listening, uh, Maureen, I think you, um, mentioned earlier, uh, or perhaps it was Amiel, about the the value of deep listening in terms of how we can connect with each other. Is it active listening? Uh, is it empathetic listening? Is it generative listening that in in which we are co-creating the future with the other party? I mean, we we have to be very intentional and deliberate about these things and that i think is is the way is a way forward for us so then let's connect that to what you're doing with and for organizations to develop leaders because i assume that is all part of the leadership development process yes i mean okay well um in terms of the heroic or heroine journey um, when a leader uh, of an organization can move um, from a heroic stance, which is typically your top-down 
um, a type of leadership and can move into a space of what we call in the Jazz Leadership Project a principle of shared leadership and or ensemble mindset. So with a jazz um, rhythm section or a trio quartet, um, there is not only a shared purpose, there is shared responsibility and accountability. And there is a common language that allows them then to be able to communicate well, to listen deeply, to hear each other, to respect what the, each individual is bringing to the process. Because in my role, you know, I am trying to achieve mastery on my instrument, whatever that instrument is, so that I can bring that to my team, my group, my community, and, and contribute. So it is uh, being able to shift the thinking because then you can see each individual when you look from a, an ensemble mindset or from a shared leadership. You see each individual and you can value their contribution. When you create that as a culture um, in your workspace, the, the, the end to uh, creativity and innovation, it, it's endless when, when that is, is where people can operate from. Um, Amiel, I'll, I'll let you jump in there. Yeah, thanks. And just to acknowledge, we have, um separate businesses we we collaborate greg and jewel run the jazz leadership project i have my coaching and consulting business we're collaborating on on stepping up uh, so you know one practice within leadership development is the reflection on what do you, what the heck are you here for <laughs> to put to put it crassly like what gets you out of bed in the morning it's one of the questions i ask at the very beginning of working with individuals and teams I want to know what actually energizes or animates them to be there. And that question um, can require some reflection. And for some folks, it's actually painful to explore the question. Why would it be painful? Because I realize that I actually haven't been in touch with that intention or perhaps not even acting on it. So it's that's challenging to do. And uh, it's essential. Uh, if I'm going to be in integrity with my intentions, the first step is to understand them. So that's one. A second way the heroine and hero's journey comes into play in organizations is when you're in the midst of change, whisper who isn't, uh, and we are always intentionally or not telling a story about the change, who gets to be protagonists in the story and who, who doesn't, who's included and who is excluded. And if you pay attention to the stories that leaders tell about what's happening, unless they're really mindful about this, there's always someone, some team, some unit that are kind of, they're not really in this. Sometimes those folks are half of the company. And so it is so helpful when you're on a journey to think about who's going along with you and then to ask yourself, is the story I'm telling including them or excluding them, right? So that's two. Um, I think a third is this piece around virtues, of cultivating virtues, that it is both part of the call of leadership. When, when I work with people and they reflect on what they wanna do in their organization, a good part of that is what are their own virtues and strengths that they're cultivating? They feel called to cultivate. That's in the answer the call part of the journey. But then when you're dealing with those ogres, which could include, Jewel was talking about listening. Um, Tom Peters, famous business author, I heard him on a podcast a bunch of years. He says, I don't know why we don't teach listening classes. Well, what is really helpful in learning how to listen, many things, practice. One of them is cultivating particular virtues. We don't often connect these things. And if the ogre in my leadership journey is me learning how to listen to you and you learning how to listen to me, we can ask ourselves, what are the virtues that we might cultivate in order to be, as Jules says, generative listeners? 
And uh, I use the Enneagram, which is a system of personal development. There are nine types. And each one essentially has a virtue that could be cultivated uh, more fully. Mine are courage and faith. So I can get distracted from listening because what's happening in my mind? I'm second guessing myself. I'm doubting the other person. Courage and faith go a long way to actually being present with the other person. So there's a whole variety of these things. And I, I guess part of what we're saying here in this conversation is that if you work in an organization at any level and you are uh, interested in the hero and heroine's journey, we got some stuff for you. If you're interested in taking on America's racial reckoning, there's no reason to leave behind the perspectives, the practices that you use in your own organization. There's no reason to leave behind virtues. There's no reason to leave behind reflection. There's, and there's absolutely no reason to leave behind having a positive mood. You don't have to go into the racial reckoning thinking everything is horrible, although a lot is. You can choose to bring forth what you've learned in your organization. I, I was just going to piggyback on what Amiel just said and, and say that moments of joy are essential. And we, we don't pay enough attention to captivating those moments of joy. And, and we need to, because it's what sustains us as, as humans. And, and, and it is what helps build the resilience that we need to face the challenges, uh, the dragons whether those dragons are internal or or external. So it, it is, I think, critically important that we find the, the levity we often, um, between Amiel, Greg, and I, will just have moments where we'll just break out in laughter at some silly thing. Um, and and it, it, it renews us and it reconnects us in a new way that then we can step forward into that work uh, with even more uh, determination and and uh, and deliberateness. Can you tell our listeners a little example of how you're using this in your own lives? Well, you know, for me, um, and for a lot of women, I think it it takes enormous courage and 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 searching to find our power. We, we are in a very male, masculine, um, dominated system and, and culture. And, and so for, for women, it takes, um, th there's even uh, a few more layers during that journey uh, where we, we don't feel that we have to rely on the masculine energy only to strive and get ahead and get into that boardroom and become that CEO. Um, and we sometimes forget about that feminine energy that sustains us, that is the creative part, that is the, the part that nurtures, is the part that um, is, is in, that has the emotions and the feelings. And so um, it's, it's been part of my journey on, on daily to, to keep that close and, and to continually look at how I am presenting myself and what, um, what ways am I uh, really engaging people and, and, and from, from what perspective. Um, I also look very carefully at how I can embrace more people in, in my, my pathway because uh, I never really used to do that with consciously. Uh, you know, it was sort of like blinders on, head down, you know what you need to do, just go for it. But to open that up and expand it is definitely a part, and, and, and I take that from the heroine journey, hold on to that as, as, as best I can. I was going to say, that sounds a little bit like the shift from hero to heroine that many of us as women started our careers living in the world of heroes. And if we wanted to progress, we took on the hero energy, even though we were in a heroine body. 
Exactly, exactly. And then sometimes there comes a point where um, th that clicks, and you and and you, you there there's a what am I doing, and why am I doing this? And you're looking for something that is going to spiritually bring more more richness and more understanding, and and that can be where it happens. And and perhaps there's a different pathway that you um, you choose to take at that point. Brilliant. So I do hear where this is helping you confront your ogres. And I also hear as I listen to you that we share some of those. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. And Amiel, how about you? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Uh, so, you know, one thing about me is I'm wired with a certain degree of anxiety. It's, you know, it's in my nervous system. There's a there's a, the body is reactive, the mind, when it's in a habit, can go to worst case scenarios. Reframing life as a hero and heroine's journey really shifts things. It really shifts things uh, because there's a sense of purpose and a sense of mission or a sense of flow, depending upon how you want to look at it. And that reframe um, energizes me I begin to feel, what is it, wind at my back, so to speak, and it puts me into a different mood. And there's actually one of the beautiful experiences, the gifts of meeting uh, Greg and Jewel. I think I met Greg, or Thomas, maybe four years ago, and discovering some of the um, work around you know, the blues idiom and the blues jazz tradition and the tradition of black American culture of uh, the author, uh, Albert Murray, who we, we wrote about. We have a book called Reimagining American Identity uh, that we can include a link in the show notes to, free, a free ebook, where we write about him. And he frames the Black American experience as the hero's journey. Who else does that? I mean, there's more than him, but really, in today's dialogue, where, where do you hear that? And it, it was such a, an abrupt kind of a slapping cold or warm water in my face. And it was, it was, it's humbling because it can, you, we can get so easily get caught in, oh, this is just a purely a story of suffering. Well, that's kind of patronizing. It's also incorrect because we're all human beings and we have all these virtues and we have, and many, we can frame it as a heroine and hero's journey. So the second way is just in the context of America's racial reckoning, it's been really helpful for me to see us all together as answering the call, being on a journey together. That, that gets me out of bed in the morning. Great, thank you. I really appreciate that because I also grew up in a family where anxiety is, is part of the wiring and the reframe sounds really impactful. So as we wrap up, where would our listeners find out more? Where would they get your ebook? How do they connect with you? So um, your listeners can go to steppingupjourney.com. And on that page, they will learn all about the course. Uh, we have all of the modules uh, laid out and they would be able to enroll uh, right on that page. Um, Amiel, is the, um, the ebook link also on there we'll if if we have any kind of show notes we can include in that it's a longer run but it's uh, steppingupjourney.com forward slash uh, reimagining underscore american underscore identity i believe that's what it is so if it's in written form it might be a little bit easier but yes we uh we'd love to have folks have a look at that book we welcome feedback on it and i actually had a friend of mine who read it one night and then she just picked out the sections on that I did because she's an old friend and she called it uh, quotable handelsman, which I was flattered by. <laughs> <laughs> so the course is kicking off in October for people who happen to listen to this show well past its original or initial airing. How would they learn about it and enroll going in later conducts? Is there an online version? Because I imagine folks will be interested well beyond 
whatever the original kickoff date is. Yeah, if, if you come to our website and give us your email address, we will keep you in touch with the next offering of this, as well as podcast interviews that we do, as well as um, other things that free events that we periodically offer. So there are lots of ways to plug in. The course starts October 6th. We'll be probably accepting people maybe a week into that till mid-October. So if you can get in before then, great. This will probably be out after that. We'd be happy to be in touch and uh, keep you abreast. Thank you both so much, Jewel and Amiel. This has been a brilliant conversation and I am delighted to share with our listeners a different approach to addressing some of our biggest challenges that allow us to change ourselves and engage with others in a way that I think will be generative and productive rather than faction creating and, and polarizing. And so, okay, so Dan said we air on November 2nd. Um, so for our listeners, thank you so much for joining. Each and every one of you has an important place in our world right now as we are all stepping into creating a future that is different than the past that we've grown up into and through. And we are at a choice point. So offerings like what Amiel and Greg and Jewel are creating are very precious gifts that allow us to be those people we want to be, that allows us to create the legacy, that allows us to be the parents and grandparents that our children and grandchildren will point to and say, I am better because of them, rather than the opposite statements. So thank you for listening. Thank you for all you're doing in our world. Please continue to listen. Please continue to make an impact and like us and share us. And we will also have a blog post from Amiel and Jewel with more information. Thank you so much, Maureen. It was a pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you.